my real pleasure to welcome to you to FAO webinar, Managing Empty Pesticide Containers, Protecting Natural Resources and Farmers in Central Asia. You are very welcome. This is the second in a series of webinars being organized by FAO's Regional Office for Europe and Central Asia in the framework of Jeff FAO projects on life cycle management on pesticide and disposal of pesticide in Central Asia countries in Turkey, which has a food system approach, considering that mismanagement of pesticide will affect not just productivity, but can also affect negatively natural resources, biodiversity, quality of food, food prices, therefore impacting the food security and the health of farmers and consumers. My name is Tania Santibanez. I am agriculture officer in the regional office for Europe and Central Asia. I am very pleased to moderate today's webinar. The purpose of the webinar is to exchange information on the challenge to address when managing empty pesticide containers and on opportunities provided by the establish of pesticide container management systems for the countries in Central Asia, Turkey, Caucasus, and Eastern Europe. Let me share, please, some technical information. Language option, English, Tur Russian, and Turkish interpretation. You can switch language by clicking in the small globe icon in the bottom. We are expecting your question and comments in writing. For this, please use QA box on the bottom of your screen for sharing your question. Please don't use the chat for this purpose. All presentation will be sent all of you as well as the recording of the event. 100 participants have been registered to, the, to this webinar. We are happy to, to have this quantity of participants. After this short technical introduction, let me inform you that the order of a speaker's presentation was adjusted slightly. Saying that, let me introduce Dr. Bahoen Wu, FAO Senior Agriculture Officer. Dr. Wu is a specialist in pest and pesticide management. He started to work on pesticide management in the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in China in 1988. He was responsible for pesticide registration system in China from 2000 to 2014. He put an emphasis on national on assessment, risk assessment, and during this tenure, more than 20 highly hazardous pesticides were phased out in China. Later on, Dr. Gu, being deputy director of the China National Center for Quality and Safety of Agricultural Products. He joined FAO in 2016 and has been responsible for pest and pesticide management. And he's acting as a team leader of pest and pesticide management in FAO's plant production and protection division. Gu, the floor is yours for opening remarks and the first presentation. Daniel, uh, Mr. Gu was just writing, I cannot hear you propose, go to the next presentation. Okay, okay. Um, so um, the idea of the presentation of Mr. Gu is was he wanted to share with us our uh, uh, the FAO policies on empty pesticide container and uh, how the, um, uh, the empty pesticide container is uh, based in the, uh, the International Code of Conduct on Pesticide Management. So, okay, uh, later on we will come back to Mr. Gu. And just, I want to, I would like to, to invite the, now will be the, the first speaker, Dr. Sheila Willis. Sheila is head of International Programs on Pesticide Action Network, UK, and she's an honorary senior lecturer at the division of Environmental Health in the School of Public Health and Family, Family Medicine, University of Cape Town, where she teaches part of the postgraduate diploma in pesticide risk management. As a doctoral student, Sheila tutored graduates in entomology and pests and disease at Oxford University before working in farmers' participatory research in Ethiopia and Kenya. 
More recently, she has been concerned with broader aspects of pesticide management and sustainable agriculture, mainly in East and West Africa, and several countries in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and the Caribbean. Shelia, the floor is yours, please. Thanks very much, Tanya. Um, if you can give me one second, I will share my screen and then we can... Great. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining. I'm really pleased to join you here today. <clears throat> I gather we've got a good uh, number of people on the webinar as well, which is, which is very pleasing. So thanks to all the organisers of this. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the work we've done at the farm level in relation to empty pesticide containers. Um, I work for Pesticide Action Network, as uh, Tanya mentioned, and we tend to focus on the issues uh, that relate directly to farmers. So we don't have expertise that go um, uh, beyond the farm in terms of what happens to the containers, but we have quite a lot of information about what happens on the farm, which I'd like to share with you. So just to talk more broadly about the uh, problem of plastic pollution in agriculture, um, an estimated 6.96 uh, million tonnes of plastic is used in agriculture each year. Um, but the scale of the problem caused by pesticide containers relative to other types of plastic in agriculture is difficult to estimate and that those, um, those numbers are actually not very easy to obtain, um, which is why we've done quite a lot of work at farm level on this. Um, Plastics, as we know, cause animal deaths by choking, entanglement, starvation. Um, and those problems have been shown already in at least 700 animal species, some of them endangered. And we're le learning more about the subtler effects of plastics on human and animal health, including microplastics and the chemical additives that are used on them. Uh, and, you know, research is showing impacts on liver and cell damage and disruption to um, reproductive systems, for example. This is just from the plastic itself. Um, I don't know if you can see my whole screen. Um, uh, the uh, image on the right there um, shows how far plastics travel. Uh, they get washed down rivers into marine environments and they can be transported vast distances. The picture shows uh, an iguana on the Galapagos Islands, which are uninhabited, surrounded by plastics. And on one remote uninhabited island, um, Henderson Island, in the middle of the Pacific, scientists have found plastics from Russia, the US, Europe, South America, Japan and China. So this is a global problem and one that um, doesn't, these plastics don't stay where you leave them, unfortunately. Um, so I'm just moving this around a bit. Uh, so um, to focus on pesticide containers in particular, of course, they're a particular problem because beyond the problems that the plastic itself causes, you've got the hazardous contents um, caused by the pesticide res residues inside. And those residues can cause um, significant problems with human um, poisoning and contamination of soils and water. Um, studies looking at the quantity of containers generated um, have been done in various places. I looked at one in Greece that was done in uh, uh, 2018 and um, of course the use, the generation of empty containers varies widely uh, depending on the types of crop being grown and the context but in this case up to 35 pieces of plastic were being generated per hectare per year. And the mean weight of empty plastic pesticide containers per farmer was 4.36 kilograms. Uh, while I've been at PAN, we've done similar surveys um, in Suriname, for example, among rice and vegetable farmers. We found a rather higher average of 6.56 kilograms of plastic per farmer per year generated. Um, and uh, 34.7 pieces of plastic on average per farmer per year, plus foil sachets. 
Uh, we did a similar survey in Antigua and we found rather less, not surprisingly, much smaller farms and less pesticide use, but still a significant quantity of containers being generated. Um, and unfortunately, uh, empty containers are quite attractive because they're made of high quality plastic. So they can be attractive for other uses once someone's finished um, with the pesticide contents. Um, and that can uh, contaminate water and food that could be stored inside and result in hazardous exposure to these chemicals. In some countries I've been in, it's quite common to purchase used pesticide containers at local markets. And on the right, you can see a market in Benin where a small child is playing with some of those empty containers. Um, surveys we did in the Ukraine and in Kyrgyzstan showed that uh, in 2014 showed that 9% of the farmers we interviewed in Ukraine and 1% in Kyrgyzstan and Armenia were routinely reusing empty pesticide containers, mostly for fuel or pesticides, but in some cases also for water or animal feed. And then those pesticides obviously can enter the food chain and cause, cause human health uh, hazards. A survey we did in um, Senegal uh, some time ago now in 2010 revealed that 10% of empty pesticide containers were being reused for domestic purposes. Um, and the picture on the right shows, uh, I think that was, sorry, uh, that was Malaysia where uh, empty containers are on sale um, for water storage, again, a real hazard. Um, another hazard that comes in relation to containers is the repacking of pesticides. Um, often smallholder farmers um, only require a small amount of pesticide when they purchase it. Um, and a common practice uh, is to decant the pesticide into a smaller container, maybe a Coca-Cola bottle or a plastic bag. Of course, that's an ex incredibly hazardous process and you end up with a an inappropriate container that may leak. It hasn't got the label or the safety information. Um, and this is a really common source of poisoning in my experience. Um, uh, to give an example, I was in West Africa last year in Benin and spoke to the head of epidemiology in the government. And just within the last month, he'd been dealing with two cases of mass poisoning from reused, um, from repacked pesticides. In one case, a family of uh, eight, six people died, leaving two small children because someone had mistaken a, uh, a bottle of pesticide in a, in, a, in a reused container, in a repacked container for cooking oil. Um, and in another case, he was looking at the same sort of thing happened with a contaminated container uh, used for cooking oil. Um, repacking is incredibly common, sadly, and, and uh, we've got a pic two pictures on the right. One of paraquat, of all things, very highly hazardous um, in a plastic bag, and that was in India. And bottom right, um, this is a retail premises for pesticides with a whole area devoted to repacking of pesticides into drinks bottles. Um, and this was a super common practice that we found in both Georgia and Armenia. And in fact, the Georgian authorities subsequently had a campaign around improving practices on retail premises as in, in response to this, to this work. So as I say, um, repacking results in um, illegal containers that are prone to leaking and spills, lack of labels that reach at the farm level. It generates hazardous waste, of course. It's linked to fatal poisonings and it's highly risky for the person who does the repacking. Uh, just to give you some figures from um, uh, various countries in Eastern Europe, uh, in the Caucasus. Um, uh, you can see, I mentioned Armenia and Georgia. Um, in the surveys that we did, repacking was, was extremely common in those countries, but it's pretty common across the board. 
um, even in Kyrgyzstan, where it was lowest, you have um, approximately 12 the 12% of farmers reporting that they buy their pesticides in um, repacked containers, drinks bottles and, and um, plastic bags, for example. Um, as we know, triple rinsing is an important way of reducing the hazard from the original pesticide container. Um, and it's something that we would support and promote. Uh, the picture on the right shows a chap um, using one of our posters um, that we produced for FAO in the Caribbean. He's in Suriname promoting triple rinsing. And I know that CropLife and probably Andy will talk about um, uh, CropLife efforts to promote triple rinsing as well. And they also have helpful resources on that. Um, uh, in order to, by European standards, in order to get containers below the, um, the level where they're considered non-hazardous, that's 0.1% of the mass of the container and the, any pesticide residue. Um, uh, that's an important step in order that those containers can then feed into the um, chain for re collection, recycling and then and or energy recovery. So um, we would support triple rinsing to reduce the hazard from those containers and enable them to be fed into those uh, processes. And in, e in 1990, the EPA did studies showing that triple rinsing could bring residues below that threshold level. However, that we would urge some caution and it can be difficult for farmers to get good compliance with that, um, with triple rinsing. Uh, and some highly toxic substances are difficult to bring below that threshold. Um, water supply is obviously an important uh, uh, issue as far as triple rinsing goes um, and some farmers don't have easy access to piped water in the area where they're handling pesticides. In Antigua, for example, we did a survey um, a couple of years ago and uh, that revealed that 68% of farmers were rinsing their empty containers and that's exactly the same proportion of farmers that had a tap water accessible where they handle pesticides. Um, you can see in the picture on the right, it's, it's not uncommon for farmers to resort to, to rinsing their spray equipment uh, and containers in rivers that are nearby if they don't have easy access to pipes water. And obviously that's a, that's a concern in terms of contaminating that that river system. Um, to move on to disposal practices, clearly if you don't have a good disposal option, then people resort to um, options which, which could end up in um, contaminating soils, water and air. Burning empty containers is quite a common practice and that releases dioxins and other toxins from the plastic as well as the uh, potential hazards from the pesticide residues. So really not advisable, but very common, unfortunately. And you can see from the graph here that um, uh, across some of the countries we worked in, Armenia, Belarus, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Ukraine, all these practices of burning, burying and discarding containers in the field are common, while triple rinsing is pretty uncommon, apart from in Belarus, it seemed to be uh, more widely practiced. Uh, we did um, a larger survey in Georgia in 2014-2015 um, uh, uh, and into 2016, and um, uh, that included 920 smallholder farmers. In that case, uh, fewer than 10% of farmers were um, puncturing or triple rinsing their containers. End users were burning and discarding empty containers in the fields. Five respondents, so not very many, but still a concern, um, said they threw old containers directly into the river. Four said they used empty containers for drinking water. So a small proportion, but still concerning in terms of human health risk. This just gives you some of the stats alongside that from the same study in Georgia. So fewer than 10% of um, 
Thomas talked about triple rinsing. Burning was a very common practice um, and highly hazardous. In this survey, we separated um, landowners, the farmers themselves, from their paid workers to see if practices were different. Of course, the paid workers um, more often said, I don't know. Um, and just to compare with other studies not, not done by PAM, just published studies, a uh, study in Greece in 2018, um, uh, which is, um, you would have thought would have some established systems for dealing with empty containers, they uh, found that 19.6% um, of containers were burned or buried, quite a high proportion. A study in Bolivia in uh, 2017 um, showed that 93% of con empty containers were just disposed of in what they called vulnerable places, that meant discarded in fields or rivers. 62% of the population did not know what triple rinsing was and 31% of the empty containers still had pesticide residues inside them. So just to um, reiterate, burning chemical waste can contaminate soil and groundwater, sorry, buried chemical waste can contaminate groundwater, while burning sites and containers re releases highly toxic fumes. So all these practices are really undesirable. So what can be done about this problem that affects farmers, but whole communities and uh, the environment we all live in? Um, looking at FAO guidelines on management options for empty pesticide containers, um, and kind of standard practice in terms of waste management hierarchy. Of course, the most effective measures are the preventative ones. Um, so uh, we would always urge looking at pesticide use and ways to minimize pesticide use um, that can protect farmer livelihoods, but also environment and health. And disposal is actually the least effective option. Um, it's um, uh, uh, dealing with the problem after it's occurred is always less effective than preventing it. Um, so looking at um, crop life figures, the plant science industry goal, as they state on the website, and I'm sure Andy will talk more about this later, um, is to continuously improve the farmer return rate and the number of countries with container management programs. The ambition up till this year, and I don't know what, what it is going forward, is to collect 50% of all containers shipped into the global market. It's feasible into end use applications. That's still only half of the containers. And I'd point out that um, of the, their 40 mature, well established container programs, return 66% of all plastic containers shipped. That leaves 44% of containers that are not recovered. and. Um, leaving us with a significant problem. So just to finish, um, I'd make three key points. One is that empty pesticide containers are a significant global problem with negative impact on health and environment for all of us. Second, that the most effective measure is to reduce pesticide use, and that can be done protecting livelihoods, protecting natural resources on which agricultural productivity depends and um, protecting the environment. And that effective container management schemes are greatly needed, but they will not entirely solve the problem. Thank you. I'll end there and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Thank you very much, Sheila, for very interesting presentation showing us how empty pesticide containers represent a high risk in developing countries. And definitely, we need the strategies to put in place for solving this problem. We need some structure, a, a strategy, but the, this should be a structure in order to solving the, not just the, as you mentioned, the empty pesticide containers, all the problems with the pesticides. Now, let me introduce our second speaker. Mr. Andrew Ward, since 2017, 
Andrew has been the Crop Life International Stewardship Director, based in Brussels. He holds a PhD in Pest and Resistant Management from the School of Development Study, University of its Angle in the UK. He worked in agriculture development for donor-funded program and in the GR, in CGR International Agriculture Centers for 20 years. It is the practical side of work that he enjoys most and has been able to benefit from living and working in Africa for 12 years, including three years in Nigeria and six years in Zambia. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tanya. And thanks very much, Sheila. Um, that's, that's set the scene really well. Sorry, can I just check, are there, are my slides sharing? Yes, it is, definitely. Great, thank you very much. So let me give a, a presentation from the industry side. Um, the status of where we are now and a little bit about where we want to go. Um, I, I think Sheila made some good points there. We want to, to continue to expand um, container management and increase the effectiveness um, of it. Um, I, myself, as a stewardship director, I, I focus mainly on the post sales ends of products and working with farmers and that angle. But in terms of container management, I also work quite closely with colleagues on the anti-counterfeit side, because another problem is that criminals take containers that have uh, previously held um, legal products and then they, they refill them um, with, uh, well, a variety of products and sell them illegally. And therefore, effective container management can also take containers away from the criminals and, uh, and make, make their, their, um, their, their businesses a little bit more complicated. And I also work closely uh, with regulators. So um, for CropLife International, we represent the six research and development companies of the plant sciences industry being Bayer and BASF based in Germany, Corteva and FMC headquartered in the United States, Sumitomo in Japan and Sagenta in Switzerland. Um, these are the CropLife International member companies. We also have, we have a hierarchical structure. So there are also regional associations and then national associations. Um, uh, we have the European Crop Protection Association in Europe and Crop Life Asia in Asia and Crop Life Africa Middle East. Now, the, the membership of the regional and the national associations may vary. These are the, the international members, but at, um, at uh, uh, a country level, there may be other members of Crop Life. However, I can't speak for the whole industry. What I'm speaking today comes from these six member companies and, and uh, where uh, their, their approach. Um, I'm sure Dr. Gu was going to talk about this and, and he will talk more. Just to note that um, earlier this month, Crop Life International and FAO signed a letter of intent and the focus of that is, is presented in this slide. But I believe that all three areas also address container management, working up from the bottom, sharing information. You will hear from this presentation that we have a lot of experience in terms of container management. And we're very open to sharing that. In terms of management of transboundary pests, um, uh, we realize that that uh, can often lead to, to uh, uh, products being bought and how can we work on, on the management of the containers there. And then also when we're talking about sound management of pesticide, that's not just the application in the field, that's dealing with the containers in a responsible manner afterwards as well. Sheila has presented very well uh, the problems with, with containers, the problems with plastic more generally. And um, 
we're not isolated in this. If you look at what's happening out there, there is a lot of focus on plastic management. Um, the circular economy is one of the pillars of the World Business Councils for Sustainable Development. Um, there is a $1.5 billion fund uh, called the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. There is the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, all that are focused on dealing with, with the plastic problem. And um, uh, we're, we're keen to be working more and more with these. And I feel as technology is moving forward, there are actually more opportunities, particularly in terms of putting a value onto those containers so that there's actually a value to disposing of them in a responsible fashion. So yeah, benefits of container management, maybe to address, and when we talk about container management, we're talking about the collection of disposal of the containers in a responsible fashion. Aligned with uh, the code of conduct, it reduces the risk that the human health and environmental issues that Sheila has mentioned, but then also moving forward um, where there are recycling schemes, there's also a benefit in terms of climate change and of course in terms of obstructing the activities of criminals uh, on the counterfeit side. When you look from an industry side in terms of where the plastic comes from, I mean plastic is a very good substance it's just the disposal of the plastic is an issue that uh, it provides a lot of safety to prevent um, uh, uh, products from leaking out and that's why the repackaging that Sheila highlighted is the issue because the containers themselves are are strong and robust but that's also an issue that they they become attractive for reuse in inappropriate manners Within the packaging life cycle, we can provide a lot of control on what's happening internally, but we're really looking into the into the left hand side bottom corner as to how can we how can we make sure that even after sales have taken place, can there be um, uh, management of those containers, ideally for recycling, if not recycling, incineration in approved facilities whereby uh, the temperatures are high enough not to produce dioxins and emissions can be monitored and ideally that there can be some energy recovery so that uh, there there are some environmental benefits from it as well and uh, preferably not landfill um, and if it is landfill to make sure that it's monitored and constructed um, in a very careful manner. So crop life um, has worked for over 30 years or crop life member companies have worked for over 30 years in container management. And uh, to date, we have over 50 countries where container management is taking place. The most recent um, developments have been happening in China where uh, container management is starting to operate at a provincial level but this has been uh, facilitated by some uh, by some government policies. Just to say that uh, when it comes to container management, we try do try to network across the the crop life national associations and partner organisations. So it's not reinventing the wheel in every country. Um, we're looking to learn from previous experiences so that we can develop as effective models that are country specific as possible, but building on that previous experience. For example, well, that's what has been taking place in China and we're currently working on, on the same in India to be developing the Indian system, but to be using examples, successful examples from other countries. So to take a quick look at some of these countries where there are, um, uh, impressive examples that uh, in Brazil 93% of containers that are coming into the market are being collected and are being recycled. Um, uh, uh, when, we, when we promote recycling or where recycling takes place 
yes, the, uh, the containers are triple rinsed and that helps to reduce any residue, but we also monitor carefully the plastics that come out of, of the recycling. They go into their own waste stream to make sure that there isn't contamination. And even so, there is a prescribed list of, of uses for the plastics to make sure that uh, risk is further reduced by keeping the, the recycled plastic away from direct contact with, uh, or constant contact with humans or contact with food. Um, in Brazil, that means that uh, some of the, the, the plastic that's been recycled has actually been mixed with virgin containers and has gone into producing new containers. And that in itself has brought about significant climate um, benefits. There's been a, it's been calculated that there's been a, a reduction in 750,000 tons of carbon equivalent through the recycling of container rather than uh, producing new containers from virgin plastic. Um, something else that I think it would be interesting to, to explore in terms of container management is not just looking at um, uh, uh, pesticide containers as a source of plastic pollution on farm. There are other sources, fertilizer bags, seed bags, um, even PPE. So how can that be managed effectively? Again, we've got experiences in France. There are 16 different uh, farm level waste streams which are, which are collected. And it's something that we're looking to, to expand more at CropLife International, working with other industries to make sure that other plastics are responsibly disposed of as well. Um, in South Africa, uh, we have um, a, a program in which uh, uh, quite high, well, high value has been extracted from the plastics. So actually the, the container management is able to pay for itself through the, the sale of the recycled plastic at the end. Um, in many program, in, uh, in other programs, uh, the container management is paid for uh, through governments and industry contributions, usually related to to the percentage of of the market that different companies hold. They will then pay uh, an amount towards the container management. So. Yeah, um, what do we need to, to have in place to, to establish um, uh, effective container management? And there are a number of uh, stakeholder groups here that, uh, that we need to have understanding and commitment from. We can't just do this as an industry. We need to be working with farmers, as has been said before, particularly in terms of triple rinsing. And I'd add to the triple rinsing puncturing containers. So that even if they're triple rinsed, they can't be reused as, as water bottles or containers themselves. And again, they're no longer of any use as they are for counterfeiters. Um, local government, to make sure that there's buy-in for them, for the local oversight of, of uh, uh, particularly collection processes and to ensure that, um, that the, the local laws help to support um, uh, uh, collection sites, which won't bring about any pollution to the environment, but also in some areas um, in Latin America, we've explored, we've discovered that uh, the, the container management can be quite effective and actually criminals will try to break into the collection sites and take the empty containers. So through working with local government, we can help to ensure that there is protection for the collection sites. Also in terms of retailers, retailers are selling the product. Um, in some countries, uh, retailers also act as collection points for triple rinse containers, but uh, at least for the retailers to provide guidance as to how to responsibly dispose of the containers. National governments, again, similar to local government, but even more important, um, one of the constraints to container management can be the classification of triple rinsed containers. Uh, quite a lot of our work in China has been working to change that classification 
and to show where triple rinse containers are, uh, are available, that they can be classified as non-hazardous and therefore transported um, in a more cost-effective manner. I should just go back to that pharma issue and the, the triple rinsing that uh, one of the strategies that's used to encourage farmers to triple rinse is that if they put the rinsate, so after they've, been, they've, they've rinsed the container, if they pour that back into their sprayer, then they're getting um, the maximum value from the product that was in the container in the first place. So trying to appeal to the farmer's um, economic sense to encourage triple rinsing. And of course, um, it's not just the six Crop Life International member companies that are bringing containers into the market. So we also have to do advocacy work. And actually part of that work is to show to other, contain other companies that this isn't as expensive as they might feel and that there is that there are real benefits to it. Of course, other benefits in terms of establishing container management are the availability of recyclers or um, uh, effective incineration facilities, the government policy, and widespread support for the triple rinsing and puncturing. Um, we've been really delighted by uh, the response of different stakeholders in China to triple rinsing. Last December, we held an international symposium on container management in China. We were actually absolutely delighted to see some of the additional work that had been developed. I mean, uh, uh, there was one young team who had developed an internet internet of things based system for um based on the qr code for for tracing and then returning containers and getting a small payment for returning the containers this was an additional piece of work uh from the chinese academy of agricultural sciences looking at the the amount of residue in containers after triple rinsing um, and uh, you see that uh, that they built this up. They looked at the residue. So in the in the fourth column, after just one rinse, um, the second rinse, and then the third rinse. And although you could try to justify that maybe you only need to do two rinses, we try to really really push on the safe side. So to promote triple rinsing, just to make sure um, that the product has been remo removed to a safe level from the container. Um, yeah, and then uh, constraints to container management. Of course, uh, people, people are concerned that it will be costly, especially to, to establish um, that where there are free loaders so that there are, are companies who aren't having their, their containers, um, they're not paying for their containers to be managed. It, it erodes trust in the system um, and can lead to container management collapse. Um, ignoring the broader experience, uh, we, as I said, in, we have experience from 51 countries. How can we build on that rather than trying to make the same mistakes that maybe some of the other programs experienced when they were established? Um, and then, uh, Rec we need to recognize that there needs to be a supportive enabling environment, a policy environment for container management, so as to ensure uh, effectiveness and sustainability. I think, um, yeah, in terms of opportunities, and then I'll, I'll be leaving this, um, may maybe I should come up, come back and just say that we do have container management strategy which will be pushing through to 2025, which is based on increasing the number of countries where container management is taking place, but also increasing uh, our effectiveness. So increasing collection rates within those countries. Um, we have reviewed, I mean, one of the classic situations is that containers that are are used in a more remote setting are often harder to to get returned or collected uh, than than um, in 
in uh, settings closer to, to where there are larger populations, but we're working to address that. And that, that's a big focus for us over the next few years. Um, as I said earlier, also looking to expand container management beyond just pesticide containers so that we can get the support of other industries as well. How can we link with uh, innovations in the plastics world? Pyrolysis is chemical recycling, that's um, turning plastics back to their constituent oils. And in doing that, you're turning plastics back to a virgin substance. So you can take the resi any residue that there might be in pesticide containers and incinerate that safely. And then the plastic that you have is as good as new. Then also, um, uh, this is something not just of interest to us, but also to, to the petrochemical industry and their interests as to how um, management of plastic can, can, uh, can generate plastic credits, which uh, would help on the finances of the system. And then looking at uh, recycling incentives, what recycling incentives are there within a country and how as an industry can we can we build on those so thanks very much for your time today i just wanted to to really emphasize that uh, uh that container management is something that has been most effective where it's been done not just from the industry or not just from the government but through the different key stakeholders working together and uh, I was always really touched by, by this African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I think in container management, we want to go far. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Very interesting presentation. And this presentation allowing us to see how the private sector can support in this area in line of the with the International Code of Conduct on Pesticide Management. Really appreciate the presentation. Indeed, if we want to solve the problem, these container uh, issues, we need to work together. I agree with you 100%. We need to work together, all the stakeholders, not just the government, not just private sector, not just NGO, all we need to, to work together. Thank you. And now, um, please allow me to introduce um, it seems could be the last speaker. No, this is not the last speaker. <laughs> so this is the um, Dr. Devlet Donard. Dr. Donard, a PhD in physical chemistry and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Utah, has worked for a multinational chemical company in the areas of crop protection for more than 33 years. He has held various positions in research and production in Europe, in Latin America. Head of contract packaging, packaging development and labeling, director of supply chain stewardship. Since 2018, he is teaching in the University of Cape Town. He was involved in the establishment of container management system in Russia and provides consultancy to CropLife International Implementing Container Management System in China. Since 2016, he has also been an international consultant for FAO on SMS, working in various projects in Malawi, Botswana, and West African countries. Please, Devlet, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tanya, for the very kind uh, introduction. And I try now to get my uh, presentation on the screen. Just a second, here we go. So I hope you can, everybody can see it now and can hear me. Yes, yes. Um, Okay. okay, perfect, good. So uh, in my uh, presentation, uh, I would like uh, to go a little bit more into details and I already appreciate your patience with me. Uh, in the following, I would like to cover uh, briefly the typology and quantities and uh, container management globally. So I would go a little bit more into detail to the issues uh, Andrew addressed 
elements of good container management implementation, residues classification. I'd seen there were some questions and I also would like uh, to have a short remark on the business model. So what you see in this slide uh, are the widely used pesticide uh, packaging. So uh, you see it's plastic, it's made of a metal, it's made of uh, glass, and uh, we have a small volume uh, and, uh, containers and uh, bigger ones. That are the one-way packages and more than 50% of the pesticides are sold as liquids. And uh, only part of these uh, containers are rigid ones. And that are the ones that can be easily rinsed. And uh, flexible ones uh, are a little bit more difficult to rinse. And uh, m many of the pesticides are classified as dangerous goods. And that means for transportation, they need special uh, high standard uh, container that have an UN approval. That also explains why there is a second market uh, and the second life of these uh, containers. Andrew already mentioned that uh, in more than uh, 40 or 50 countries, there are collection schemes operating. Many of them are operating since more than 20 years. And uh, we have also a lot of uh, uh, startups and, uh, and uh, systems in the design phase. Over the last 13 years, uh, the collection rate of the uh, benchmark countries, by benchmark, I mean benchmarked by CropLife International, has tripled. So we are closely to roughly uh, 90 to 100,000 tons per year that's already collected under the benchmark scheme of uh, CropLife. And uh, you have seen in some countries like Brazil, the return rate is uh, bigger than 90%. But that are countries that have, I would say, mainly an industrial farming. Whereas uh, going to the small and medium uh, enterprises, like in Africa or in Latin America, we face a different uh, situation. And uh, let me uh, continue. And uh, I also would like to share with you my view about the prerequisite for good container management. I mean, the legislation, and that has been stressed already, supports or should support container management, good container management, and that uh, the elements are extended producer responsibility, circular economy, but also quantitative criteria for the classification of waste. We were talking here about 0 0.1, 0.01 percent. That are quantitative criteria, and I will come to that a little bit later. We need a sound business model. That means an organized scheme and a durable financing. I mean, although uh, the cost uh, for collection has been decreased, there's still a uh, substantial amount of money to be paid to have a running uh, container management system. Suitable infrastructure, that means logistics, uh, including intermediate storage, treatment, recycler, disposal has to be in place analytical and regulatory monitoring. I mean, when promising something, we also have to check it and to follow up. And that can be done by analytical uh, monitoring. And we need an ongoing commitment of stakeholders. That means we need the awareness, sensitization and training of the farmers. We need incentives. Uh, and we also need to some amount enforcement and we have also to provide convenience. I mean, looking at Africa, we are uh, complaining that uh, containers uh, end up in the nature, but there is no way for these uh, uh, farmers to get rid of these empty uh, containers. And I think the objective when introducing good uh, container management is to get uh, know-how transfer. So the region or the country is able to manage the packaging waste in a sustainable manner on its own. And in uh, many, many uh, areas we have seen that uh, there were donors spending a lot of money, a pilot was running, and as soon as the donors uh, stopped uh, financing the project, the uh, container management scheme collapsed. And therefore we have to take care that there is an ongoing uh, financing 
for the container management system. And talking about the success factors, we also have to turn the coin around to see the flip side. And that means there are pain points. That is low priority of governmental and importers and uh, stakeholders. There's a lack of uh, suitable infrastructure. Uh, logistics uh, in the reality look uh, very challenging when you go to remote areas, you have poor road uh, conditions and long distances. And one point that destroyed some uh, pilots already in the past, for instance, in India and other countries, was that there is a non-durable financing. And in general, there is a poor waste uh, management and uh, understanding what waste means. Uh, I also would like to take that opportunity to make a short excursus on uh, management of obsolete stocks and empty rinsed pesticide containers, because that sometimes is mixed and uh, put together, and I think that should be kept separate. The op stocks are dealing with phased out and uh, op stock uh, pesticides, sometimes also with contaminated soil, whereas the empty rinse containers deal with empty primary packaging. In Opstock case, the products are not approved for use anymore, are not suitable for use. Whereas containers collected normally come from products that are approved for use. Ideally, obsolete stock management is a one-off operation, whereas empty rinse pesticide container management is a recurrent operation. That means it will happen every year, every season. So ideally, obsolete stock issue, the quantity will be declining. Container management, whenever the system is growing, the quantity of uh, material is growing. Obsolete stocks means we are dealing product with packaging. Empty rinse containers means we are dealing with packaging with traces of product. So that means 99.9% of the waste stream is packaging. And uh, that is a difference. We agree, uh, obsolete stock, highly hazardous waste, but uh, the empty rinse pesticide containers can be, in some cases, non-hazardous waste. And I will come back to that uh, a little bit later. So the recommendation is really to keep management of obsolete stocks separate from container management. Now, I said good container management is a multi-stakeholder issue. I mean, the first thing is to have the good and suitable packaging. That is uh, the responsibility of the producer. The second thing is uh, the cleaning of the packaging, triple rinsing, pressure rinsing. And the third issue is uh, the check and collect the packaging via a dedicated system. And you see, uh, the uh, person checking the container, that's a visual check, but we can do better. If we look into the issue of uh, residues, there are two sources of residues. One is the adhesion and the other one is migration. Adhesion is everything that sticks to the container walls, inside, outside. That can be removed by proper rinsing. Migration is something that get, gets into the container walls. It's like the resin in the cake. And that cannot be easily removed. However, that is normally a, a very, very tiny fraction. But both of that adds to the residues. And we have analytical ways to check uh, the residues in the uh, waste stream. And the Concentration of the residues triggers is a classification of the waste stream. And you see uh, here we have an, a limit value uh, that is 0.1%. That follows the European legislation that says if the accumulated concentration of trigger compounds is above 0.1%, it's hazardous waste. And opposite way says if it is below it's non-hazardous and here you see the reality. Andrew was talking about the French system that is taken from a French collection scheme and you see the bars here uh, indicate the quantity of product left in the waste stream and you see it is below one order of magnitude from the threshold value but not all legislations have a threshold value and that makes things so difficult because 
So many legislation outside Europe are based on the precautionary principle. And you can then not come up with real uh, threshold values when you say that is uh, hazardous waste or non-hazardous waste. That makes it so difficult to declassify the waste. And uh, in reality, if we strictly apply the principle of uh, precautionary for uh, the packaging waste, that one is more severely classified than food. I know some of you don't like that statement. Uh, let's go into an example. Let's suppose we have one uh, kilogram of recycled plastic and that one kilogram contains 1.2 ppm of a residue, of an active ingredient. That is 1.2 milligram of uh, that compound. If you have now a container of water and you put that uh, block into that water and you wait long enough, then you will have an equilibrium of the uh, residue in the plastic and uh, in the water. And then you can end up, up uh, that's a little bit simplified, but you can end up with a concentration of uh, 0.06 ppm of that active ingredient in the water. And if you go into the waste classification, that uh, means uh, you are in the green area. But if you go, for instance, into the drinking water uh, uh, limit value, that is 0.5 ppb, then of course you are out of the uh, limit. And that means that's not anymore allowed uh, to use and to drink that water according to the European standards. And that also explains to you why an used empty pesticide container, even after rinsing, is not suitable for storing of food. And I think uh, that is something uh, people uh, normal, uh, frequently mix, that they say, well, if it is a uh, triple rinse, then we have reduced the amount of the pesticide in the container to less than 0.01%. But that translates then to a concentration in the packaging waste to uh, far below 0.1%. And then they say, well, uh, there is no um, uh, residue anymore, and that is wrong. And now let's have also a look about the speed of uh, the uh, uh, leaching. Leaching is the opposite of migration into the container. Leaching means now the active ingredients leave the plastic, and you see uh, at the beginning the leaching rate is very high. So that means at the beginning, uh, we have a very high amount of uh, active ingredient leaving uh, the plastic. And let me now come to another point, uh, treatment of the plastic. I mean, we have the post-consumer resin entering a uh, treatment facility. That is a treatment facility. And the treatment facility cleans up the plastic and uh, it comes out and uh, plastic, uh, cl more clean plastic. It's like the kidney in the human body. And uh, that uh, post-consumer resin on the outcome can be then recycled. And Andrew already pointed that out, that uh, the recycling, the material recycling of that plastic has dedicated end uses. And that uh, is also uh, well described in the catalog. It looks complicated, but there are end use options available. You see that in drainage tiles, in uh, new containers, fence posts, and so on. Now, let me come now to the last thing that is the commercial part. Um, here we have an, a business case that shows you a little bit uh, the financial implication. In that uh, model uh, academic calculation, we have uh, roughly 280 tons of uh, plastic shipped every year to the market. And when we start now a collection scheme, it starts at low values and then we end up with some 66% uh, in that uh, model. And that is uh, associated with some cost for the operation for all the other uh, topics and uh, tasks a uh, collection scheme has to fulfill. And you see that red curve shows you the specific cost, the cost per kilogram collected. And that follows somehow a Boston consulting curve. That means 
With increasing experience and time, the specific cost will decrease. That is uh, based on experience and also on the economics of scale. If you multiply quantity with specific cost, you have the cost of the system. If you have, and now you see, you have to have a financing system and that is done here with a green curve. And here we calculated with an um, cost and financing of one US dollar per kilogram of primary packaging sent to the market. If you compare cost and uh, financing, then you come to the resulting curve. That is a little bit the economics behind that. And uh, we certainly can uh, go into that uh, in more detail. But uh, for the moment, I would like to finish my presentation and thank you for your patience dealing with such a numeric work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Devlet, for the great presentation and the clarifying the key concept introducing the container management system and the main challenge and the opportunities for its implementation in our countries. Really great presentation, thank you. And now um, I would like to invite Mr. Gu, a senior agriculture officer and team leader of pesticide management at FAO. Mr. Gu? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, Tanya, dear colleague. I'm extremely sorry for my late journey and especially missing the, yeah, uh, at the beginning, yeah, opening uh, remark. Uh, yeah, it seems that uh, my computer got problems, uh, they attacked by the virus because the word program didn't work, didn't work. So, yeah, but uh, now I would like to uh, not only to welcome uh, all for you, but also appreciate you are organizing the webinar and your participation, especially uh, thanks, uh, thank Sheila, Andre, uh, Detlef for their excellent participation, which provide plant of valuable information regarding the container management. I think uh, all of your presentation provide valuable information making our website successful. From the above presentation, we know that addressing container management is important. However, it is difficult and challengeable in terms of the regulation, policy, technology, financial mechanism, and engagement of key stakeholders. And, uh, Containment is important part of uh, life cycle management, and uh, it has been important uh, aspects of FL pesticide management program. So next, uh, I would like to share some of my thought uh, uh, with you regarding the uh, containment. Can you see the screen? Yes, yes, yes. it's fine. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, key point is that container management is a key element of life cycle management pesticide. I want you to uh, share briefly on some uh, three uh, soft first importance of the FAO policy guidelines, activities, I uh, said so is a container management screen. So yeah, as as colleagues, as, as the previous uh, presentation mentioned, that there are a lot of pattern tennis go to the market and at the end became the waste in the environment. They are posing pollution to soil and uh, groundwater, risks to human health, and become a bigger problem to the farmers and the Lulu environment. I visited uh, some big farmer, uh, farmer, uh, farm farms in Africa and found that there are a lot of empty containers stored in their farms. And this is really, they are really a headache problem for them to deal with it. They don't know how to treat with it. 
and then they need support of garments of leather the stack hold. And uh, so container management is important. It can ensure the products in good quality, safety during transportation and the storage. And also good package will provide sufficient information through for the level for appropriate use of pesticide such like this the table, this uh, label. And also most importantly, contaminant will reduce risk to the human health and the environment as presented by the previous sick. Uh, so the contaminant will contribute to the SDG 3, 6, and also sustainable management. Sustainable agriculture as well improving livelihood of farmers. And also now there are increasing requirement for waste management, especially practice and global care chemical management framework. In the past, we mainly mentioned chemical management. Now waste management have been aided into the tools. So normally we often mention the chemical and the waste amendment, not only on chemical amendment. And also I feel the member of the Basel Convention Partnership on Plastic Development, focusing on container amendment. So this is a new trend of the uh, waste amendment, especially the plastic amendment, in, uh, including the empty, cat, uh, uh, empty container amendment. So helping Container management scheme is important and essential. So what the current FAO policy guidelines, technical issues regarding the uh, container management. As I said that, FAO are approaching the life cycle management approach for pesticide from the research, registration, production, use, and at the end is dispose of stalkers and empty container management. And in the code of conduct, I think everyone knows it, there are specific articles regarding container management. 175 adopted the life cycle approach to address all major aspects, including pesticide containers. Under the article 10.4, the gamut shall take the necessary regulatory measures to prohibit the repacking and the decanting of the, any pesticides into food and beverage, animal feed, etc. And 10.8, this is very important. Gamut's industrial, international organization, Agriculture community and the vector control program should implement policies and the practice to prevent the accumulation of the used container. Yeah, accumulation. So recycling, disposal, etc. And uh, another article is a pesticide industry traders provide effect technical support for effective management of empty pesticide container. Yeah, Andrew uh, informed us, uh, Color of Life and its member, pesticide industry are actively involved in the program of uh, container management. FAO and WH also issued, developed uh, alliance or management option for empty pesticide container. From these guidelines, you can know key elements regarding the uh, empty container management scheme. And uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Detlef already addressed some, issues, some uh, elements, and also Andre, his presentation also addressed uh, the issues. I will not go details. And FAO are supporting member countries on container management. 
taking Africa, for example, they are supporting the rich developing regional strategic action plan. We also support the developing national strategy and the business models. And also we are conducting pilot for recycling and as well as support the awareness raising and training. Yeah. There are challenges such as inequity, rich aesthetic framework, no proper classification, weak engagement of key code, and also lack of the incentive, sustainable financial mechanisms. Yeah, as, as a colleague mentioned. Yes. So there are many elements for candy management scheme. And here I just want to highlight two issues with you. First is the mechanism of developing the container management scheme. So it shall be covered below issues. First is the legal basis. Legal container management, I think, are two parts of legal uh, uh, issues. First is the regulations on requirement for the packaging of pesticide in registration set a specific requirement on the packaging due legislation. Second is specific container element scheme, the policy or regulation. Andrew mentioned that China. China newly published a new regulation on empty container element. And regarding the uh, container management scheme, there are two kinds of the uh, scheme. One is a voluntary scheme, loaned, operated by the companies and those. Second is legally managed scheme. I think this is more effective, more sustainable. Yeah, and not the details. Yeah. And the second issue is economics and incentives. This is very important. You know, the Containment scheme needs to be economically viable if they are to be sustainable. I'm taking one model in China, for example, and mentioned the uh, active factor in China. So the model like this, farmer bring empty content to the retailers, pesticide shoppers, and they can get a reduction of the prices. For example, one bottle, one package, you can get 10 cents reduction of prices. And the pesticide retailer sell the uh, reduce the cost, uh, reduce the prices uh, based on the quantity of the containers. So doing this way, farmer are incentivized to bring or return empty container to the collector, the pesticide traders. Then the traders proceed, proceeding, and then a specific entity in China, in one province, is a pesticide company. They collect the empty container to the, uh, to the company and they wash the thing and uh, select the thing and uh, treat the in different way for disposal, for recycling, for other purpose. Yeah. But how it is financially sustainable? The government provide incentive, provide financial support to the retailers who collect the, uh, collect the uh, empty content from farmers. And also government provide financial support to the company who do the recycling, yeah, operating the whole scheme. This is one 
uh, one example in China. Another example is a voluntary uh, uh, scheme, so mainly organized, implemented by the company voluntarily. Yeah. And uh, in the Chinese scheme, the industry have active engagement. They provide technical and financial support on it. Yeah. Third element is that uh, infrastructure and, uh, and uh, logistic. This is very important. I also is very important. We should have a uh, uh, have a uh, entities to get out the scheme. This is very important. Normally, this entity should be uh, integer or integer association. And the second issue I want to mention is stakeholder. So multi-stake approach is the only approach. Yeah, as a colleague, uh, uh, previous speaker uh, mentioned that. We showed engagement of the governments, industry, NGOs, retailers, users, farmers, and academic and the institute. They show their own work, own roles. Yeah, roles. So uh, the key is that government and industry, key partners, government and the industry, there are two important stakeholders. Yes, stakeholders. So engagement of relevant stake for suitable container management is crucial. So today webinar have present and participants from different sectors, including governments, industry, and NGOs. And it is the first formal webinar of FAO on this topic. And it also, I think, is a good example of multi stakeholder engagement. Container management, a container is an important part of pesticide production. And its management has become an increasingly important issue in global pesticide management and the environment production. But I think we are still weak in these aspects. And it's hope that all partners will cooperate, work together to address these issues. In Central Asia and Turkey, it's hope that we could work together to develop a appropriate country specific container menu scheme in the areas and the countries through so the Jeff FL project life cycle management of pesticide and the disposal of purpose pesticide in Central Asia and Turkey to improve the capacity of life cycle management in the countries, especially the empty pesticide container management. And also it's hope that your successful screen could provide good examples of container management scheme for other countries and regions in future. It, it is a successful webinar. And I think it's a good start of the joint activities and uh, container management scheme in Central Asia, Turkey. So thank you all for very much. Congratulations to the uh, excellent position and I hope that uh, the, the webinar will be very successful and also the success of the projects and uh, empty container management in Central Asia and uh, Turkey. Thank you very much. At the end, I uh, still uh, show my yeah, exchange sorry to the, uh, my uh, missing the uh, beginning. Yeah, thank you very much.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Gu, for your kind words. Really, we appreciated it. And also for sharing the FAO your policies and approach and this is him and activities on container management system. As you mentioned very well, all these schemes and proposals based in the most important, in my, as, as my personal, and I think that most of the people also think the same, that the most important FAO document in pesticide is the International Code of Conduct on Pesticide Management. Also, I, I, I would like to point it, and I agree with you, as well as with Andrew, um, as Andrew mentioned, the multi-stakeholder approach is the key to tackle the, with these issues. And I think as FAO, we can facilitate this in order to put all the stakeholders together and to try to solve these specific problems. Okay, with that, we, um, we finalized the first part of our webinar in, when our key speaker sharing with us their views, their approach. And now um, we will have Five minutes break before starting with the panel discussion, with the, uh, which will be moderated by a student. So please take five minutes and we can back in five minutes. Okay, we have a break, five minutes. See you at 12.05. Oh, hello, we are coming back. Now we will start um, with the second part of our agenda. This is the panel discussion. A panel discussion will be moderated by our um, senior advisor, technical ad advisor of the POPS project, Stephen Robinson. Um, I pass the floor to Stephen. Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, it is actually the first time in my life I do uh, manage a virtual <laughs> panel. So I'm still wondering how this will be. But I think it's a little bit the same challenge as introducing container management systems in countries. So we have heard now four very interesting presentations telling us uh, what's the challenge, but also what should be done. But obviously this all will happen in a concrete environment. And so we wanted to invite uh, four uh, eight countries from our region to have a little bit a better understanding what is the realities. And uh, I hope that uh, I have formulated three questions. And uh, based on these three questions that we have a uh, moment, uh, uh, that these three questions then will help us to better understand what are the challenges we need to discuss. Now, let me quickly see that I get it right. Okay, now we have the questions. Okay, so let me quickly, uh, as the slide is not visible, uh, only the questions quickly tell you who is participating and I would like the eight panelists to open up their uh, microphones. We have Miss Ala Loboda uh, from the Ministry of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources of Ukraine. We have Miss Khayala Dadashova, the head of the Plant Protection Department at the Azerbaijan Food Safety Agency. We have Lilia Nazarbayeva, who is a chief specialist in the Governmental Chemical Commission in Uzbekistan. Then uh, Ms. Veronika Tertea, director at the, in the political section of the Plant Protection Department in Moldova. Then Mr. Almas Alakunov, who is in the, working for the Department of Chemicalization in Kyrgyzstan. Dr. Yunus Bayram, who is the Acting Deputy Director General of the Department of Food and Control at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Turkey. Then uh, Mr. Mikolo Meschi, who is the head of the Plant Protection uh, Department of the National Food Agency of Georgia. And finally, we should have Mr. Rahmaturo Khairuloev, who is a chief specialist at the Committee on Environmental Protection in Tajikistan. Unfortunately, he had to leave on a very short notice 
uh, to a field trip. Uh, so he's replaced by uh, Mr. Umed Ulugov, uh, who will then be providing the answers on his behalf. Now we have multiple languages, uh, part of the, uh, I hope everything works out with the Turkish, Russian and English channel. Uh, so my first question would be, obviously to understand what's the problem is we have to understand how much pesticide packaging is sold on the market uh, every year uh, in your country so that we have an idea do we have to deal with 1000 ton or 10000 ton of various wastes and uh, we have to base our governmental or national strategy based on that volume so, uh, Ms. Loboda, could you uh, give a very short number on that one? Uh, uh, Хорошо, спасибо вам. Госпожа Дадашова, что вы знаете про Азербайджан? Эти цифры озвучены? Дорогой Стефан и дорогие коллеги, я тоже приветствую вас всех. И хочу сказать, Азербайджан – аграрная страна. У нас многие растения, растительные производства. И еще у нас вредители тоже есть. Поэтому мы тоже используем пестицидов. Но Азербайджан на нет производства. Очень мало пестицидов. И поэтому мы импортируем каждый год. Почти э, за годом мы импортируем 8-9 э, тысяч тонн пестицидов. И все это пестициды выставлены на продажу. Хорошо, спасибо вам за этот очень понятный ответ. Лилия Назарбаева из Узбекистан. Что вы знаете про Узбекистан? Лилия, да. Также я э, могу сказать вам точных цифр, потому что эта информация находится в Министерстве сельского хозяйства, и ее нужно нам официально запросить, чтобы нам дали официальную информацию. Но я могу сказать, что э, по, по итогам 2017 года, э, например, примерно э, из расчета на 5 миллионов гектаров по всей стране, используется в среднем где-то 0,4 килограмма пестицида на гектар из этого расчета. Хорошо. Спасибо вам, Лилия. Госпожа Тертея, добрый день. Здравствуйте. Большое Здравствуйте. спасибо, вы с нами. Что, что вы можете нам показать про Молдова? Вот на первый вопрос, какое количество первичной упаковки пестицидов, к сожалению, мы на, на уровне страны не ведем такой учет. Мы ведем только учет количества пестицидов, которые импортируются. Мы за год где-то импортируем и применяем 4000 тонн, но пустая упаковка, у нас нет таких норм и мы не ведем, к сожалению, учет. Спасибо вам. Uh, maybe to change now the language, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Bayram uh, for on behalf of Turkish. Bir de ekim alanı ve üretim miktarından belki yola çıkabiliriz. Türkiye 24 milyon hektar bitkisel üretim alanı olan bir ülke. Aynı zamanda da yaklaşık olarak 48-50 bin ton civarında pestisit kullanılmaktadır Türkiye'de. Dolayısıyla bundan yola çıkarak şöyle bir şey belki de tahmin edebiliriz. Türkiye'de bir tahmini olacak yani ne kadar doğru olduğunu tahmin etmek imkansız. 
3 bin ton civarında bir ambalaj olma ihtimali ürüne endekslediğimiz zaman böyle bir rakam veya bunun üzerinde bir rakam tahmin ediyoruz. Yalnız şöyle bir bilgiyi uluslararası düzeyde de paylaşmak istiyorum. Biz 2018 yılında bitki koruma ürünü takip programı uygulamaya koyduk. Kare kod sistemi. Bütün Türkiye'de 81 ilde uygulanmakta. Bu programda bitki koruma ürünleri üretilirken fabrikada veya ithal edilirken giriş noktalarında kare kodlanıyor. Ve buna tek kod. Her bir kutu için tek bir kod. Aynı zamanda e, toptancı ve bayiye giderken de toptancı ve bayiye giderken de aynı kodla okutularak devam ediyor ve son kullanıcıya yani e, çiftçiye de kimlik numarası üzerinden bu ürün veriyor. Dolayısıyla bu izlenen bir 2018 yılından beri sağladık. Biz şunu size diyebiliriz. Hangi ilde hangi ilde, hangi bayide, hangi fabrikada, hangi toptancıda ne kadar kutu var, ne kadar ambalaj var? Bunları şu anda dijital olarak verebiliyoruz. Dolayısıyla 2020'den sonraki yıllarda sadece kilo ve ton bazında değil, kutu ve ambalaj yüklüğü bazında da net dijital verilere sahip olacağız. Sahip olacağız. Hali hazırda da herhangi bir ille ilgili verileri çok rahat bir şekilde kare kod programında Tarım Bakanlığı'nın kullandığı tek bir program ve Türkiye'deki bütün bayiler, bütün toptancılar, firmalar, fabrikalar Hepsi bu programı uyguluyor. Tek bir program. Bu program izlenebilirliği sağlıyor. Yani üretildiği noktadan tüketildiği noktaya kadar bütün zincirleri sağlıyor. Bu zincirlerin içerisinde atık ambalajların takibi de dahil olacak. Dolayısıyla biz bir ilim performansını ölçerken o ilde ne kadar ürün toplatıldı ve ne kadar ürün vardı, yüzde kaç başladı oldu bunları da izleyebileceğiz. Teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't hear the answer because I have some problem with the language channel, but I hope uh, I, uh, you have been able to finish uh, what you want to say. Uh, so the next person I would like to ask is from Kyrgyzstan, uh, Almas Alakunov. Uh, Almas, što vi znajte pra skolka pustitari, ka šti got vi polučajte? Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги! В Кыргызстане ситуация такова, что ежегодно фермерами Кыргызстана используется где-то 650, от, от 600 до 650 тонн пестицидов. Все пестициды у нас в Кыргызстане импортируются, и где-то 90% это из Китайской Народной Республики, КНР. Из 650, то, что мы говорим, тонн пестицидов, 320 тонн – это инсептициды, 220 тонн – это гербициды, и 110 тонн – это фунгициды. Это вот по видам. Из этих пестицидов да, где-то вот образуются от 80, от 80 тысяч до 85 тысяч э, пустых контейнеров, то есть э, это 5-10 литров, э, литровых э, канистр. Э, в основном эти э, э, канистры, то есть э, пустые контейнера, они в основном э, сжигаются в муниципальных, э, муниципальных свалках, ну это где-то... Алмаз, это мы будем как третий вопрос спросить. А, все, все, все. Хорошо, но 80 тысяч, 85 тысяч пустых контейнеров каждый год. Потом да. можем брать калькулятор, сколько каждый весит. Это, это вот получается, что мы разделяем где-то на 5-10, потому что в основном у нас в Кыргызстане завозятся 50 литровые 5-10 литровые пластиковые канистры вот это расчет импорта импорт составляет 650 тонн и вот это как бы расчеты спасибо алмаз so the next person i would like to ask the question what do we know about how much Empty packaging uh, weight is generated each year is uh, Nicolas Meschi from Georgia. 
Uh, Nicolas, uh, you have to unmute your microphone. Sorry. Hello to everyone. Uh, as you know, uh, our agency is uh, responsible for uh, registration and the control of uh, pesticides and uh, fertilizers. Uh, annually, up to uh, 3,000 metric tons of uh, pesticides are imported into the country in the plastic and polyethylene packaging. Uh, pesticides containing um, uh, copper come in 50 kilograms polyethylene packs and uh, other pesticides are mainly in uh, plastic one liter containers. Uh, unfortunately, in Georgia, there is no uh, registration process uh, for containers, imported containers, but every year, uh, approximately 500 tons of uh, uh, containers are imported uh, in Georgia. Thank you very much, Nikolos. And then the next last person I would like uh, Umet from Tachiki student to ask. Uh, Umet has not a very good connection, so I hope that uh, he hears us and we can hear him. Добрый день. Спасибо большое за возможность сегодня участвовать на этом семинаре. От имени Комитета охраны окружающей среды хочу сказать, что Информация, которая была получена для исследования данного вопроса, запрошена в таможенном комитете при правительстве Республики Таджикистан по коду ТНВ. Как и многие наши коллеги, Таджикистан не производит абсолютно и никогда не производил пестициды, но является импортером продукции. По нашим данным, на 2019 год Из дальнего зарубежья было поставлено в Республику Таджикистан 730 тонн э, пестицидов. Из них э, примерное количество, около 85%, приходится на Китайскую Народную Республику. И на ближнее зарубежье приходится 72 тонны. В итоге 812 тонн пестицидов. Отдельные статистики по упаковке в Республике Таджикистан предоставить не можем, поскольку такая... Таких требований по законодательству нашей страны не существует. Спасибо, Умит. Then uh, let's go to the next question. As Detlef uh, and also Mr. Gu have pointed out, if we work on empty pesticide or in general on pesticides packaging, we do not have to do only understand the amounts or the type of the materials, uh, but also is there any regulation, uh, any legislation in your country which uh, discusses uh, pesticide packaging from import through uh, as Andrew Ward has shown, the sales chain, the recollection scheme, uh, and then the end, uh, either recycling or disposal. So a question to all of our eight panelists would be, do you have a legislation which at all discusses pesticide packaging? And one important question, if yes, are they at the end classified as hazardous waste or as non or there's no classification as hazardous waste. So let's maybe start again with Ukraine, with Ala Loboda. Госпожа Loboda. Да, да, да. А, хотела сказать, что да, у нас законодательство для этого есть. А, плюс мы очень активно сейчас разрабатываем а, новое законодательство. То есть у нас а, в седьмом месяце этого года а, было принято Верховным Советом а, новый закон об управлении, а, управлении отходов. И а, мы ждем а, вот второго голосования. Этот закон предусматривает все возможные варианты, которые мы действительно хотели бы исправить, той системы, которая есть в нашей стране. И э, у нас есть разные варианты по поводу э, именно э, утилизации имтары с под пестицидом, но утилизация в нашей стране не предусмотрено, все, что касается утилизации самих пестицидов, мы отправляем те страны, в которых это разрешено и предусмотрено. 
но согласно нового законодательства, согласно тех новых направлений, которые разрабатываются нашим министерством и правительством нашей страны, мы делаем все возможное для того, чтобы были инвестиции в это направление, для того, чтобы у нас была идеальная контроль в этом направлении. У нас происходит реформа государственной инспекции экологической, потому что отсутствие контроля, какая бы система ни была утилизации, но если нет четкая система контроля, в этом есть тогда проблема. И так как у нас есть заводы по производству пестицидов, у них и предусмотрено сразу на их территории вариант вот это трех вариантов промывки тары под пестицидов. Если я ответила на ваш вопрос. Хорошо. А пусти тары они классифицированы как токсические отходы или они без классификации? К сожалению, сейчас то, что я говорила, мы хотим эту систему исправить, и классификация правильно будет им присвоена после принятия в ближайшее время нового закона. Спасибо вам, Алла. Я хочу спросить одно и то же вопрос про законодательство госпожа Дадашова из Азербайджана. Да, законодательство Азербайджанской Республики, закон о фитосанитарном контроле и другие нормативные акты содержат положение о пустых контейнерах. Пустые контейнеры также считаются токсически опасными, как пестицидов. Хорошо, спасибо вам. Это все четко и ясно. Спасибо вам. Узбекистан, Лилия, как у вас выглядит этот вопрос? В Узбекистане, конечно, создана база законодательных и подзаконных актов, регулирующих отношения, связанные с производством, использованием, хранением химических веществ и а, также безопасным обращением с пестицидами. Есть постановление Кабинета министров номер 2438 от, э, за, по-моему, в 2013 году это постановление было принято, э, и все э, в, э, на, ответственность вся возложена, у нас есть э, орган такой государственный, УСХИМПРОМ, на которого возложена ответственность за по управлению, э, за программу по отходам и ре, ее реализации. <связь> за объем образования отходов, повышает уровень вторичных отходов, контроль за сбором, вывозом, захоронением, использованием и нейтрализацией отходов, также разработка норм и других нормативных документов по обращению с отходами. Спасибо вам, Лилия. Это там интересно слышать, что у вас есть. И госпожа Тертея, как там выглядит этот вопрос в Молдове? Ну, в Республике Молдова на национальном уровне, конечно, есть законы и подзаконные акты, которые регламентируют требования к использованию упаковки. Также у нас законом предусмотрено, что использованная пара из пестицидов нельзя использовать и в других целях. Также предусмотрены меры, когда экономический агент обязан возвратить пару, пустую пару экономическому агенту, от которого он покупал пестицид или сдать эту пустую тару тем экономическим агентам, которые имеют лицензию на переработку такого вида упаковки. Для того, чтобы упаковка была не загрязнена, он должен, согласно требованиям, ополаскивать три раза эту упаковку, а также ее проколоть для того, чтобы она была недоступна для использования других лиц и в других целях. Вот примерно такое. Но я смотрю у нас по закону об отходах. От 2016 года предусмотрено, что 
препараты или упаковки могут быть отнесены к, качеству, к, к опасным отходам, если они включают в себя следующие свойства, если они канцерогенные, коррозионные, тетрогенные, мутагенные. Поэтому я на сегодняшний день не могла определить, упаковка у нас относится к опасным или к неопасным, поскольку если она уже пустая, она помыта три раза, я не могла определить, к какому, какой группе опасности она относится. Я лично думаю, что она не опасна. Хорошо, это вы заканчиваете ответ с вопросом. <laughs> Я думаю, очень важный вопрос, какой всегда да, нам, конечно, отвечал. до конца, да. Хорошо, для меня to change the language, I would like to ask Mr. Bayram to let's share with us whether there's already legislation in Turkey discussing the uh, question of empty containers and whether it's hazardous waste or non-hazardous waste. And as I said, I don't understand your answer, so I hope I will, uh, uh, I will understand when you have finished to answer. Please, Mr. Dr. Bayram. Thank you, Mr. Moussaïn Moderator. Why did you ask me a question? Why did you ask me a question? Did you hear me? Was that the answer? Okay, my camera is frozen. Okay. Teşekkür ediyorum. Türkiye'de son yıllarda özellikle e, sıfır atık projesi e, Türkiye genelinde uygulanmaya başlandı. Ve bu bütün e, bakanlıklarda, kurumlarda, özel sektörde sıfır atık projesi başladı. Amaç e, bütün atıkların tekrar geriye dönüşümü ve toplatılması, çevrenin korunması. Çevre Şehircilik Bakanlığımız tarafından. E, bu e, sıfır atık projesi kapsamında 2017 yılında da Ambalaj atıklarının kontrolü yönetmeliği yayınlandı. Bu yönetmelik çerçevesinde e, tehlikeli atık ambalajları dahil olmak üzere bu yönetmeliğe tabidir. Tarım ve Orman Bakanlığı olarak biz de illerde e, atık ve ambalajların toplatılması pilot projeleri yürütmekteyiz. Teşekkür ediyorum. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, brief answer and I hope it was uh, interesting to our Turkish or to all our audience. Then, ja, gaat ils prasits almas. Kak wugle di tu vas vapros sakana datlstva? Almas? Еще раз приветствовать всех коллег относительно нормативно-правовых актов. У нас действует именно в части пустых контейнеров и связанной с пестицидами семь нормативно-правовых актов. Но, тем не менее, у нас есть пробелы в законодательстве, потому что на сегодняшний день есть нормативы, которые не актуальны или не, 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 не отображают современные условия. То есть применение в практике требований нормативных правовых актов по управлению пустыми, пустыми контейнерами не всегда и не везде соблюдаются. То есть есть такая проблема. Это связано прежде всего с отсутствием инфраструктуры, то есть типовых складов пестицидов, материальной базы, средств обеззараживания и так далее. Да? И вот на сегодняшний день назрела необходимость работки и принятия актуального закона о надлежащем управлении пустыми контейнерами. Относительно того, что классификация 
классифицируется или нет, то на данный момент он не классифицирует, тара не классифицируется как опасный. Опасный, он не классифицирует, он не подлежит классификации на, на данный момент. Хорошо, спасибо вам, Алмаз. Я думаю, конечно, вопрос будет потом, почему не классифицирован или что база для этой не классификации, но я думаю, это будущий разговор. Я хотел, как... Uh, I would like to ask as the next person, uh, Nicolas Meschi from Georgia. <coughs> Uh, so the waste management policy in Georgia is defined by the Ministry of uh, Environmental Protection and Agriculture. Uh, on December 26, 2014, uh, waste management code entered into force. Uh, the objective of this uh, code is to establish a legal framework uh, for waste management in order to implement measures facilitating prevention of waste Uh, and the increase in their reusability. Environmentally safe waste processing, uh, including recycling and uh, separation of uh, secondary raw materials, uh, energy recovery from waste and uh, safe waste storage. Uh, the code classifies most uh, hazardous waste, uh, H6 toxic substances and uh, preparations including extremely hazardous ones. Uh, the storage and uh, disposal of empty uh, pesticide containers uh, is regulated by resolution uh, 451 of December 31st uh, on the approval of uh, technical uh, regulation on rules on storage, transportation, uh, sale, and use of pesticides and agrochemicals. A draft law has been submitted to Parliament of Georgia on the expanded uh, responsibilities in environmental sector, according to which pesticides importers shall be liable for disposal of uh, containers. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Every country has another answer, and probably if we would put them all together, we would get the ideal answer. Uh, Umet, uh, если вы с нами, uh, как там uh, у вас в Тачикистан законодательский вопрос? Относительно законодательства Республики Таджикистан ситуация выглядит следующим образом. Помимо профильного закона Республики Таджикистан об охране окружающей среды, существует закон о э, отходах производства и потребления, где отдельно регламентируются проблемы, связанные с обращением опасных отходов. Мы не можем с уверенностью говорить, что тара из-под пестицидов может быть отнесена к категории опасных отходов, поскольку прямого указания на этот закон и нет. Но мы обращаем внимание на закон Республики Таджикистан, принятый в 2019 году за номером 1567 о карантине и защите растений, где есть прямое указание о причислении тара из-под пестицидов к опасным отходам и обращению с ними в особом порядке. Относительно маркировки и требований к языку э, текста пестицидов отвечает аж три закона. Закон о стандартизации 2010 -го года за номер 668, закон Республики Таджикистана о защите прав потребителей от 9 декабря 2004 года за номер 72 и гражданский кодекс, часть 2 Республики Таджикистана от 11 декабря 1999 года. Кроме того, обращаю ваше внимание на наличие специального распоряжения Министерства сельского хозяйства 10 февраля 2016 года об утверждении порядка хранения и использования обезбреживания пестицидов. На данный момент законодательное регулирование выглядит именно из этих законодательных актов. Можно ли говорить, что эти законодательные акты достаточно на данный момент? Я считаю, что нет, поскольку законодательное регулирование должно формироваться на базе э, более э, высокого уровня законов, нежели как распоряжение Министерства э, сельского хозяйства, которое на данный момент, к сожалению, не исполняется. Поэтому, на мой взгляд, кроме законодательных актов, необходимо продумать механизмы контроля за выполнением э, данных нормативных актов. Спасибо вам, Умейт, для краткий ответ. Uh, thank you very much to all the speakers that you're really having questions down to the point. Now, let me come to the final question. This is certainly the question where Detlef and Andrew are most interested, because that's obviously another starting point. Uh, 
besides the quantity and the legislation is what do you do today with your empty pesticide packaging? I mean, do you bury it? Is the common practice landfilling? People to simply throw it out in nature? Is there some sort of a collection scheme? Do you triple rinse and recycle it? And, or do you have possibilities for high temperature treatment, energy recovery in your country? Gaspasa Loboda, Magu Vamma Piat, that's Kakpierve Slova. Я так понимаю, с меня начинаем. Да. Да. <laughs> да. Хотела сказать, что у нас это действительно считается как опасные отходы, и утилизировать невозможно просто так, как бы можно было какие-то другие отходы и каким-то методом. Заводов у нас для этого сейчас, к сожалению, нет, но то, что я уже повторюсь, мы в этом направлении работаем, и я думаю, что в самое ближайшее время мы эту ситуацию исправим. Другой момент, что у нас в этом направлении есть серьезные контроль и те производители которые их не тара есть система что возврат этой тары назад производителю и они уже делают там тройное промывание еще то есть определенную процедуру для следующего использования по поводу того что как мы делаем с этой дальше поступаем старый тару которую мы не можем три раза промыть и использовать повторно она она не может быть просто утилизирована у нас в нашей стране. Мы специально есть у нас места для хранения вот этой тары, для дальнейшего уже утилизации согласно процедуры. И что очень важно, очень мне нравится в новом нашем проекте закона, который мы очень ждем, что он станет законом, работаем со всеми ассоциациями, профилями и другими институтами, чтобы он действительно был очень, очень качественным. Это то, что там есть момент внедрение системы расширенной ответственности производителя, которые устанавливают требования для производителей упаковки нести ответственность за полный жизненный цикл созданной упаковки. Это очень важно, потому что если не будет вот этого полного цикла ответственности производителя, то эта ответственность тогда не выполняется и результата мы не видим. И то, что я говорила, это жесткий-жесткий контроль, который а, мы хотим сделать не просто жесткий контроль, но и чтобы это было очень эффективно в нашей стране. Спасибо. Спасибо вам тоже. И хотел передать слово госпожа Дадашева из Азербайджана. В соответствии с законодательством в агентстве создана инвентаризационная комиссия, в комиссии входят сотрудники разных министерств, комиссия и физические и юридические лица, которые работают в этой сфере, они тоже несут ответственность. ответственность. В все пустые контейнеры собираются и обеззараживаются на полигоне, но, к сожалению, в нашей республике нет настоящей обстановки для утилизации. Поэтому все старшие пестициды и пустые контейнеры просто там сохраняются. Спасибо вам. Я думаю, это Джангийский полигон или это другое место? Да, да, Джангийский полигон. Да. Спасибо вам. Лилия Назарбаева из, из Узбекистана. В некоторых источниках, в частности, я проконсультировалась со специалистами Минздрава и Госкомприроды, Известно, что многие годы запрещенные непригодные просроченные препараты, а также тары из-под них, утилизировались на специально отведенных местах для утилизации рядом с захоронениями и домогильниками. На полигонах утилизации и переработки тары из-под пестицидов у нас также занимается Новоильский, Новоильский электрохимзавод, который производит, но и в то же время может утилизировать производит пестициды и занимается утилизацией тары. По определенным технологиям он перерабатывает эту тару в полиэтилен или полиэтиленовую крошку для применения в 
промышленности. За исключением пищевой. Это обязательно условие, только не для пищевой промышленности. Значит, в последнее время пестициды становятся нездраво менее токсичными, потому что токсичные пестициды у нас уже попадают под список, который запрещенных, либо же ограниченных в применении, только каких-то исключительных случаев. Поэтому посуда, которая не сдается обратно фирме, производителю, у нас э, есть фирмы частные, которые получают лицензии, то есть занимаются переработкой этой, этой посуды, этого пластика, э, которые имеют возможность закупить э, вот, э, перерабатывающие аппараты, машины, которые занимаются переработкой. Также они сжигаются или перерабатываются в полимерных, полимерную продукцию. Производятся трубы, также полимерные крошки, полимерный полиэтилен. Все за исключением пищевой индустрии. Да. Спасибо вам, Лилия. И следующий я хотел спросить одно и то же вопрос к Вероника Тертея из Молдова. Да, спасибо. У нас, согласно законодательству, мелкая упаковка бумажная полиэтиленовая разрешается законом, чтобы, чтобы сжигалась согласно инструкциям, которые разработаны научно-исследовательским институтом по защите растений. А, а упаковка, которая возвращается, производитель собирает, ополаскивает, как я уже говорила, прокалывает. И в два раза в год передает на переработку экономическим агентам. Правда, на уровне страны не все экономические агенты собирают в данное время, и не каждый экономический агент готов или ответственным за то, чтобы он передал эту упаковку. У многих производителей эти упаковки, несмотря на то, что они ополаскиваны, они хранятся в разных помещениях, ну, в специализированных помещениях, но хранятся у экономического агента. На уровне страны есть такой вопрос, что все экономические агенты, которые продают пестициды, они не очень неохотно собирают обратно от, от э, сельхозпроизводителей упаковка, Упаковку, потому что они при ввозе пестицидов платят за, за эм, эм, платят 1,8 процентов от стоимости пестицида в фонд правительства, и поэтому они считают, что на уровне страны вот на уровне страны правительство должно разрабатывать такие механизмы, чтобы они были не вовлечены в эти вопросы, поскольку они оплатят за это, за загрязнение окружающей среды. Значит, вся этот, этот вопрос должен быть перенесен к производителям. Спасибо вам, Вероника. Очень интересный вопрос. Много элементов есть, но тоже еще работа в период. Спасибо вам. Uh, I would like to continue uh, again in English and I would like to ask Dr. Bayram to give uh, the Turkish uh, an analysis of what are the Turkish realities. Thank you. Ee, özellikle Türkiye'de e, atık ambalajların imhası ile ilgili yetkilendirilmiş e, tesisler var. Bu tesislerde imha edilmesi mümkün. Biz illerimizde atık ambalajlarla ilgili konteynerler dağıtıyoruz. Bir de ilaçların hazırlama ünitelerinin olduğu e, yerler de hazırlıyoruz. O e, köylerde, o yerlerde hem ilaçları orada e, kullanıma hazır hale getiriyorlar. Hem de yakınında konteyneri de kullanarak toplu hazır orada konteynerler de toplanıyor. Ve ondan sonra da toplatılarak e, imha tesislerine imha ediliyor. Son zamanlarda bazı üniversitelerimizle ortak projeler yapıyoruz. O üniversitelerimiz e, bunları geri dönüşme de kazandırıyor. Geri dönüşme de kazandırmak üzere topluyor. Yani bir adım ötesi e, bir daha kullanıma e, 
kullanma sunmak üzere e, altyapıda, e, yer altıdaki tahliyelerde kullanıyorlar. E, dolayısıyla e, biz araştırma üniversiteleri, üniversitelere işbirliği yapıyoruz. Hatta bu konuda bizim e, firmalarımız ve e, bitki koruma ürünleri e, derneklerimiz de çok gönüllü bu sene bir pilot proje yaptık. E, bir ilimizde pandemiden dolayı birkaç yılda yapacaktık. Ama pandemiden dolayı imkan bulamadık. Şu anda bir ilimizde bütün ilçelerimize 300'ün üzerinde konteyner dağıtır, araç toplama ruhsatlı ve tam teşekküllü bir kamyonet, büyük bir kamyonet ayarladı ve bu ilimizde bu konteynerlarda toplatıp bir üniversiteyle işbirliği içerisinde imha edilebilecekleri tesiste imha ettirip geri dönüşme kazandıracakları da geri dönüşme kazandırmak üzere bir çalışmamız var ve bu projeyi başlattık. Hatta Kasım ayında önümüzdeki ayda da bunun başlangıcı var. Bütün e, şeyleri hazırladık, e, altyapıyı hazırladık. Kasım ayında da proje başlangıcımız var. Aynı şekilde FAO, üniversiteler, e, derneklerimiz, il müdürlüklerimiz ve Çevre Şehircilik Bakanlığı bizim proje partnerimiz. Farklı illerde farklı kuruluşlarla ve özel sektörle projeler yürütüyoruz. Farkındalık projeleri yapmaya çalışıyoruz. Önümüzdeki yıllarda e, FAO ve benzeri gibi uluslararası kuruluşlarla desteğiyle bunu bütün ülke genelinde yaygınlaştırmayı düşünüyoruz. Şu anda da bizimle birlikte e, hem il müdürlüklerimiz hem e, ilaç derneklerimiz tesisler, bütün korma derneklerimiz e, ve firmalarımız sizi dinlemektedir. Teşekkür ediyorum. You are muted. Thank you very much uh, for your answer. Uh, so, Sichas budit tripastlidni tam panelist Almas. Kakita vugludi tu vas v Kirgistani. Almas. Almas. Uh, Microphone. Как я говорил, пестициды в республику в основном завозятся пластиковыми контейнерами, 50-литровыми канистрами, и в итоге у нас ежегодно собирается где-то 80 до 85 тысяч пустых контейнеров. Из этих контейнеров где-то 50% уходят на муниципальные свалки, то есть он, они уходят на свалки, и там постепенно они вот сжигаются. Еще другого 30% они используются вторично. Это будет как вторично, это в основном для для топлива, для топливных, ну, не хозя... ну, для хозяйственных, не, не для э, пищевых целей, а в основном для хозяйственных целей. Э, раньше было, ну, 20 лет назад э, люди во многом использовали в пищевых целях, а сейчас, на данный момент, э, такого сейчас э, очень мало э, эпизодов. И где-то 20% она закапывается в сельской местности. Следует отметить, что ежегодно департаментом химизации защиты... Алло? Алло? Can you hear Almas? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Seems I'm out. Uh, seems my Zoom hung up. Hello? 
Hello? Hello? Алмаз, хорошо, я сейчас вас слушаю. Да. Я вас потерял на конце, вы там уже все сказали. Да, я хотел еще рассказать насчет... Алмаз, это почти есть очень большая эхо, я думаю, мы тормозим здесь, и я пойду дальше к Николус, если вам нормально. So, in Georgia, um, uh, there is a, uh, a list of uh, there is a, <coughs> a list of um, uh, uh, companies um, under the Ministry of Agriculture, which uh, have been issued the permits for uh, disposing pesticides. Uh, and also similarly, there is a uh, state company under the Ministry of uh, Economy overseeing disposal and uh, processing of solid waste, uh, including cleaned plastic containers. And uh, uh, there is uh, 10 business operators um, uh, functioning in total here. Uh, in frame of state uh, program, uh, every year our agency is uh, conducting uh, large scale campaign um, against uh, especially dangerous pests like uh, brown marmorated stink bug and also uh, locusts. Uh, we are using mainly uh, synthetic pyrethroids and other insecticides. Um, and uh, on the uh, basis of a uh, contract uh, concluded with the uh, uh, Black Sea Waste Management uh, Limited. Uh, empty containers were removed and uh, later disposed. Uh, for example, since 2017, uh, the company in total disposed um, about uh, uh, 50,000 kilograms of uh, empty containers. Uh, at this stage, uh, a recommendation has been issued uh, for the country regarding empty container management, uh, triple rinsing and uh, municipality, municipal land filling of which farmers are uh, currently being um, uh, apprised. Stefan, you are muted. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nicolas. I последний panelist is Umit. I так понимаю, мне дали, да, возможность Да, да. Отлично. А в случае Республики Таджикистан следует говорить о э, юридическом аспекте и фактическом аспекте. Юридический аспект. Распоряжение Министерства сельского хозяйства от 2016 года за номером номер 16 по порядку хранения и использования обеззараживания пестицидов предусматривает четкие правила по обеззараживанию тары. Естественно, ее нельзя использовать повторно. Она должна быть захоронена в специально отведенном месте. Для таких мест у нас есть два полигона. Один находится на севере, другой находится на юге. Объем и потенциал этих полигонов достаточно большой для того, чтобы захоранивать все упаковки из-под пестицидов в Республике Таджикистан. Более того, Тара, которая может представлять опасность в виде пожароопасности, она должна затариваться отдельно от других видов тары, содержащих в себе опасные отходы, включая хлориды магния, должны быть захоронены в бетонированной основе, то есть не просто захораниваться, но захораниваться в бетонированной основе, то есть в бетон, заливаться в бетон. Фактически мы видим, что несмотря на существование распоряжения, в нашей стране процедура по сбору э, данной тары не проработана. Она является ответственностью собственника этой тары, что делает процесс достаточно уязвимым с точки зрения ответственности и отсутствия контроля в данной сфере. Э, возможно, будет другое мнение со стороны специалистов Министерства сельского хозяйства, поскольку они являются разработчиками данного распоряжения, но на моей практике, поскольку я осуществляю постоянный мониторинг состояния двух полигонов, за последнее время на этих полигонах не было захоронено 
ни одного контейнера, за исключением тех, которые мы вывозим самостоятельно, когда очищаем объекты от устаревших пестицидов, включая и тару из-под них. Sorry, I'm still I'm always thinking and then I forget. Thank you, Umet. And I think we have seen eight countries with eight very different uh, answers and realities. Uh, I just want to quickly say that uh, within the project, we are currently in the midst of hiring an international consultant on container, uh, establishing national container management systems. And we hope that at least in four of the countries which have been now on this panel, that we will uh, be able to start soon working on improving what is already there on empty container management. Tanya, with that, I would like to hand the word back to you. So the microphone is yours and I will mute. Okay, thank you very much, Steven. Thank you very much, our panelists and also our speakers for sharing your experience and approaches. When we are speaking on pesticide container issues, the problems start with the plastic usage in agriculture. Almost a million tons of plastic used in agriculture per year. This is absolutely a global problem. The empty container just is a part of it, but they have serious health and environmental risks added on the top of the plastic pollution. Therefore, it is particularly important to deal with the container management and support the countries to build and maintain the container management system as part of the life cycle management of pesticide, not just as a piece of the, it is, should be part of life cycle management of pesticide. Our key speakers gave us the great picture about the importance of the container management to contribute to reduce the human health and environmental risks. We had the chance to hear different views of the different role players and through examples understand, we understand better how to build a container management system at national level. Also, we understand better how that this, there is several challenges. However, also there is a good opportunity. Also, your approach was introduced and the mechanisms which are important to develop a um, container management system. In our region, there are some progress. However, we need to do a lot in order to establish and strengthen a container management system. The establish of the system in our region is facing technological, legislation, education, and resource, resources challenges. However, the multi-stakeholder approach is the key to tackle with empty pesticide container at national and also at regional level. In this regard, FAO two months ago launched the Hand in Hand initiative promoting collaboration and cooperation between countries, which could be a good mechanism to support our Central Asia countries to tackle with this problem. So we have all this uh, structure in order to support countries. As mentioned by Stephen, the regional POPs project in Central Asia, uh, with the support of the network of pesticide management, that they are part of the panelists, that they share all their experience and, and views, we will start the assessment of um, what is the situation with empty container in our region in order to define a strategy, in order to define some um, schemes to manage these problems. And this could be to strength the system where already exists, but it's possible that it's necessary also to build new system in several countries. Saying that, and before to say goodbye, I would like to thank all our participants for joining us. This is, we are really appreciate that more than 100 people join us in this uh, webinar. Thanks the organization, interpreters, 
and technical team working behind the scene for making this event possible. I wish everyone a nice day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And we will invite you the new regional webinar that we will organize, I think, in December. Thank you very much again and have a nice day. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.